all over the world. There's a mighty revelation of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. All over the world, the Spirit is moving. All over the world, as the prophet said it would be. All over the world, there's a mighty revelation of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. All over the world, the Spirit is moving. All over the world, as the prophet said it would be. All over the world, there's a mighty revelation of the glory
Thank you, Jesus. Amen.
I'm overwhelmed today. It's a joy for us to be together at this time where everything is so strange and different from us all. Many of us are fighting different battles, and as you look at the news and you, you see what's going on all over America, the changes and the differences, your heart saddens, or well, my heart saddens, as I see how people are reacting to one another, but we should be reacting in love towards one another. We should be praying for our country, <coughs> or should be praying for all this stuff that's happening. Hallelujah. Prayer does make a difference. And it's only the Lord that's going to change the heart of my man. That's what changed my heart. From being the sinner that I was, lost to the gutter, to where he's brought me today. Am I perfect? Absolutely not. But you know, I believe that the hand of the Lord is upon me. And I, I think differently than what I used to do. And I'm thankful for that. Praise God. Good to see you. We've got Solomon and his brother with us here today. Yeah. Um, first time, he's our little miracle baby over there. And uh, I had the flag up on the platform last week. Somebody said, where's my flag? But it's up there this week. Right there on the forefront. I'm grateful uh, today to be with you all. Such an honor. We take up the offer at this time. All we do is you stretch forward if you want to and grab an envelope from the seat in front of you and you can fill that out sometimes you on the service and just drop it in the basket at the back. I will thank all those that send in their tithes and offerings. I will thank all of you who have been faithful to bring your tithes and offerings into the storehouse and that's why we're able to do what we can. We're grateful for that and if you want to leave your offering in the way out, that will be good too. As we did, uh, leave at the end, we go from this side and they go out down the stairs and then to the, uh, down the stairs and you can tell us a little bit in the parking lot at the bottom. All right? So uh, it's good to have you. We've got a special speaker with us this morning and, and I know that he's going to bless you. He's encouraged me and I want to encourage him. It's good that we can encourage one another. Amen? Praise the Lord. I've got an opportunity of taking the table this morning. Yesterday, on Friday, I had a wedding rehearsal up in Ackworth, Georgia, which is a good bit away on a Friday afternoon going over there in the traffic. It's quite a battle to get to this location we were. And it was uh, out in the open air and uh, it was nice. But yesterday, during, it was Sam and Gail's grandson that was getting married, Josh to a beautiful girl named Savannah. And they were getting married in the open air. And Bonnie had helped me do my wedding ceremony. And the wards and it's up and and I know the wards that are coming forth. The wards were just beautiful wards. And as I'm standing speaking to the young couple, I'm thinking behind me. You often wonder what that preacher's thinking when he's speaking to you. Well I was in the back of my mind I'm thinking, I wonder how much of this they're going to listen to. And the words that I was given were just absolutely beautiful. I mean, it was all from the Word of God. And if you're ever in a tough place, or if you ever don't know what to do or where to go, then I encourage you to get it from the Word of God. He is our everything. Everything that we need is in that, in that book, in the Bible, that can help us through any situation, whatever it may be, whether it be sickness, whether it be sadness, whether it be short on cash, whether it be trouble between you and the wife, or the wife and you, whichever one it is, he can help you along the way to do the right thing. And I'm honestly standing there before your grandson, you were there, Sammy, and his beautiful bride, and I'm thinking to myself, I wonder how much of this are they hearing? And then I said to myself, well, maybe they are hearing it, but how much will they apply from what I'm telling them into their marriage? Because if only they knew how it, what I was telling them was life-giving, they would have grasped it and understand that when you're young and you're just starting off, sometimes you think, well, what do they know? 
Jim Houck, the smoke tomorrow. Him and wonderful Wanda who have been married for 58 years. Yeah. One of them deserves a medal. Yeah. I'm not going to say which one, but one of them deserves a medal. But it's one of them to have here. We wish you a very happy anniversary. Sam and Gail, they've been married for 60 years. Can you imagine that? 62 years. 62 years, Sam? 61. We won't add any more to you. 61 it is. Hallelujah. What an honor to have you in our presence. Can you imagine how much advice we can get from them? I told the people at the wedding that Maggie and I had been married for 40 Two years. Now let me tell you, marriage is not all a bed of roses. You've got your ups and your downs, and at the stalk of the rose, the rose is beautiful, but down that little stalk, those little sharp things that can draw blood sometimes. And maybe Maggie felt a few times like drawing blood from me, but we're here by the grace of God. That's what I'm saying. And I said that to say this, we've come to be, have communion, and you get your communion ready, your cups ready. Paul has the cups all done for us, and you peel off the top one, you'll get the bread on the, on the top of the thing, and then pull up the, the bottom piece, you'll find the juice. The bread is symbolic of the Lord's body, which is broken for you and for me. And he went to the cross because he loved us so much. He cared for us too much, so much. He went there so that you and I really may enjoy everlasting life with him. That's why he went. It says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that whosoever believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. This morning, just imagine that you're the bride and groom today. And I'm going to ask you, well, how much of this are you going to really take in? It's all right if I give you the words from the Word and I tell them to you, but how much of that that I give you are you going to apply it into your heart and life? You see, when I speak and I minister, I'm speaking to myself first. I need it first. I need it more than anyone else. I need the grace of God to be living in my heart and my life. And if I just know the words and I don't apply them and I don't walk in them, then I'm missing out because there's so much for us as a church to have. We have to lead here different. We have to lead here changed as we apply what we hear in our hearts and lives. And that's what I want to try and get across to us, to us this morning as we break bread together. We've all heard it. I would say nearly everybody here have heard a sermon on the table before. I want you to listen to it as if it's coming afresh to you. This morning, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, it says these words. For I have received from the Lord that which also I deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take heed, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same manner. He also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Verse 28, it says these words, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. As pastor, it's not my place to judge anyone. It's an opportunity for us to commune with the Lord, to get together with the Lord fresh this morning. This is your chance. We'll never relive this moment again. We can walk out that door, God forbid, and get hit by a bus. But this is our chance. This is our opportunity for the Lord to hear our voice, for the Lord to see afresh our heart as we take of the bread this morning. Hallelujah. Now it's a watch because I can't believe it. Then sometimes one bit comes off and the other one doesn't. Here we go. As I come to the bread, and I want you to hold it between your fingers for a moment. 
as I pray over the, the bread and the wine this morning, I want you just to close your eyes. Perhaps hear my words. But I want you, the Lord to hear you to give him thanks for the sacrifice he made. Father, I am so grateful this morning for this congregation. I'm so grateful for each and every one as we've gathered together. Lord, I'm grateful because of you. I'm grateful, Lord, because of the sacrifice that you made so that I may enjoy eternal life with you. What a privilege, what an honor to have you in my heart and my life. And for that this morning, Lord, I remember my partaking of this bread that you made a sacrifice for me. You were beaten and you were bruised. And I thank you, Lord, that you were willing to do it because you loved me. You loved every one of us here today. And we are all grateful and we're all thankful for that sacrifice that you made in your precious name. After the same honor, the Lord, he took the cup. But he's given thanks. As this is symbolic of your blood that was shed for us. Hallelujah. I remember you today, Lord. I give you honor today. I lift you up this morning higher than any other. And I pray, Lord, as we partake from this cup. And as we remember that your blood was shed for us. I know, Lord, that you love this everyone and you care for us and we are here today to give you thanks in your precious name i ask you to bless every home that's represented every person in this place lord speak to them minister to them love them care for them lead them guide them direct their paths so that we don't lean on our own understanding lord but we put our trust completely on you and we give our lives over to you and we allow your word to teach us how to teach how to to be with our wives how to be with our children how to be with our neighbors how to be with our family lord jesus let us apply all those things in our hearts in our lives so that we can be changed in your precious name in jesus name i ask his blessing to be upon you
17. There is an awful storm in this text here. Paul is in a ship and they're out of the will of God. They weren't supposed to go in the direction they went, but there they are now in the storm. Acts 27 17. When they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship, and fearing lest they should run aground in the sorty sands, they struck sail and so were driven. And because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. On the third day they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Now when there was neither sun, stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest beat on us all, hope that we would be saved was finally given up. Understand they're in a dark, dark place. When all hope is gone, you're in a dark place in your life. And now Paul stands to speak up to them. Acts 27, 22. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Acts 27, 29. Then fearing lest we should run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors, four, from the stern, and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, when they had to let down the skiff, meaning lifeboat, into the sea under pretense, meaning pretending, of putting out anchors from the prow, Paul said to them, unless these men stay on the ship, you cannot be saved. Verse 29 said, four anchors from the stern, and pray for daylight to come. So apparently, the main thing for them to survive the storm was being anchored properly. I'm speaking on that word alone today, the word anchored, just that word alone. Because it's only a matter of time before someone here today goes through a storm. Amen? Now this is a quick story. I'm not going to take much time on it for the sake of time. But it's a true story. And some of you might even remember this story. It wasn't that long ago. But in March of 2009, two NFL players and their friends, one was a college player about to go pro, were fishing in the Gulf of Mexico. The true story. And a storm came. And they saw it coming. So they put their anchor out. And this was the headline. NFL players and friends in Gulf of Mexico have been, has been concluded it was caused when the boat was improperly anchored. It capsized. The story ended telling how the NFL player and the college students' life were lost. And only one lone survivor stayed out at sea for two solid days on a float, something, floating on something. And the end of the story is saying that it was overall just a mistake in the anchoring. Anchoring is obviously very important in the natural, but it's, it's so vital in the spiritual. Yes. Amen? Yes. That's why the scripture mentions that they put four anchors out to keep them from drifting far into the rocks into disaster. You need to have your life anchored. Yes. Now I'm going to give you three things Paul instructed them to do when you're in a storm. Number one, brace up. Acts 27, 17. Brace up the ship. They see the storm. Know it's, they know it's coming. They know it's going to get bad. They're saying we need to brace this ship up. We need to reinforce it a little bit. The way they did that in ancient times was someone would take a very large thick rope and he would jump off the ship and he would go underneath the ship and climb back up and they would repeat the process until the ship was fully braced up and not to go through a storm. I truly believe that's a powerful instruction. When you understand this is what you are to do when you go through a storm, brace your mind with the Word of God. The first thing you should do when you enter a storm is brace up. Brace up your mind. Jeremiah 1.5 said, Before I formed you in the womb, God called me and ordained me and knew everything I would go through in life, every up and down that He has given me in faith. I need to get to the other side. Jeremiah 29, 11. It braces your thoughts up when you declare the word of God. I know the plans you have for me, good and not evil. 
One translation says that you have a future filled with hope. That's something you need to hear when you're going through a storm. Hope. You have to brace your mind up with the Word of God. Because if you don't, fear will take over. Worry will take over. Depression will take over. Discouragement will take over. Disappointment. So you brace your life up with the Word of God. Maybe it's a financial storm some of you is going through. Brace your financial world with the Word of God. Malachi 3.10, if I will open for you the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing that there will be enough room, there will not be enough room to receive it. He'll supply your needs. So brace your mind with the Word of God. Acts 27, Paul was saying to them, cheer up. Cheer up. When the storm, when you're in a storm, it's no time to sit and be depressed and whine. It's time to cheer up. Hope must rule your heart. Hope. Control your attitude. The joy of the Lord is your strength. It could be so much worse. No matter how bad the storm you're going through, it could be so much worse. Cheer up. The, the message of Christianity is victory, not victim. Not despair, not depression. The message of Christianity is victory. This is a faith that overcomes the world, overcomes death, overcomes hell. Demons can't stop it. The devil himself trembles at it. You have the anchor that is stronger than whatever the enemy might throw at you. So cheer up. Be of good cheer, Paul said. Right in the middle of the storm, he said that. Be of good cheer. He's leading you, the scripture declares, from a place to ever, a place in everlasting victory. Get that in your head this morning. God's not leading you to defeat. He's leading you to everlasting victory. Don't you quit now. Embrace your life. Embrace your call. Embrace your marriage. Embrace your business with the word of God. Cheer up. Brace up. Strengthen up. Strengthen that which remains. Lastly, Acts 27, 18. Lighten the load with their own hands. Lighten up. You see, when Paul said to them, when they were, you understand, when they were sailing, they would go to different ports, and they would pick up things along the way, and I'm, I'm imagining in those days maybe leather and wheat, and things like that. And when you're going through a storm, that weighs you down. And in life, it's very similar. Before you know it in life, you get filled with stuff you see, you think you need, but when you go through a storm, it, it's unnecessary. It'll cause you to it will cause your boat to sink. And you'll understand that it really didn't matter all along. The responsibilities and the distractions from the main purpose, you're calling Jesus Christ. So when we go through a storm, quit waiting on God to do everything and take your own hands and throw that stuff overboard. Throw it all overboard. Throw the baggage of complaining overboard. The baggage of depression. The baggage of fear. And the baggage of bitterness. Throw it overboard this morning. You have to unload. When you're going through a storm, get down to what's important, which is Jesus Christ. Amen? Because when it's done, your baggage can sink your ship. Paul put it like this. Lay aside every weight that does so easily beset you. These are three things that in my life I've had to personally throw out, throw overboard when the enemy tries to come into my life. And I'm going to share them with you real quickly. Number one, insufficiency. Insufficiency means you're not smart enough. You're not talented enough. You're not wealthy enough. Maybe so, but I got God, and that's enough. If I got God, he'll take me places I've never been. He'll guide me to places I'll never go. And he'll pay my bills. Amen? Amen. Insufficiency. Get it off your boat this morning. Number two, insecurity. I can't do this. Yes, you can. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen? Throw it off your ship today. The last one, insignificance. No one really needs you, Michael. You're not that important. No one needs you. You just threw yourself up there on a pulpit. But what God's doing is he's telling you, when you, when you, he's helping me out when I'm in the middle of the storms. He's having things like that happen. 
so that I may th throw all the extra baggage overboard and focus on the main thing, which is Him, the most important thing. So that I may be confident and bold and courageous for Him and stand in my faith. Understand this boat doesn't keep itself in the storm. It doesn't keep itself. It's the, it's the anchor that keeps itself. So grace up, cheer up, lighten up. Because Jesus is our anchor this morning. Throw, it over, throw all the extra baggage overboard and carry on. When people are anchored improperly, it can cost them their lives. See, the Bible says this. They got to a certain place, and Paul said, we put four anchors. We wanted to make sure we were properly anchored. And I want to take a moment and give you the, those four anchors. The first anchor was the anchor of purpose. I'm here for a purpose that is stronger than the storm. Two things about purpose. One, purpose predates your conception. Jeremiah 1.5 before I was in my mother's womb, God had a plan and a purpose for my life. Number two, my purpose was planned without my input. God said, this is why I'll put you on this earth. He didn't ask for your opinion. He didn't ask for my opinion. He said, this is why I'll put you on this earth. He put something in you that is unstoppable as long as you're doing what God has called you to do. And you need to focus on your purpose this morning when you get into a storm. Focus on what's ahead, not what you're going through. Losers focus on what they're going through, but winners focus on what they're going to. Hebrews 12 and 2 said, Looking on to Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith, our faith, who is the joy that has set before him, despite the cross and the shame that was set before him. I messed that up, I'm sorry. What enabled him to make it to the cro that cross was what he was seeing, he saw his purpose. He saw what could happen on the other side of the crucifixion. And that's what you have to do today. God has used failures. God has used sinners. But God cannot use quitters. So you have to drop the anchor of purpose and say, God, put in me, put in my heart what you have called me to do. Put within me what you have, God, you have given me for this business, what you have given me for my life and my purpose. God is for me. He is not against me this morning. There is a divine purpose connected to my life, and I will focus on the shore and make it through the storm. I'm not going to talk about what I'm going through through the storm. I'm going to talk about what I'm going to. Number two, the anchor of courage. When you're going through a storm, you have to have courage. That's what God told Joshua. Be of good courage. Give me some courage when your storm comes. We don't whine when the storm comes. We stand up tall and say, I have Jesus with me and I can make it through the storm. I can make it through any storm. There's no storm strong enough for Jesus. If I'm broken or if I'm de devastated, in, in any moment, either you can either wither down to nothing and say, I give up, I give up. Or you can stand up with a spirit of courage and say, if God is for me, who can be against me? I'm going on. Courage is finishing the race, even when you're in last place. Courage is forgiving a neighbor. Courage is loving a husband or a wife in a matter of a crisis that they caused. Courage keeps on. Courage is refusing to let disease take away your smile. Take your joy. Courage is saying, my destiny is greater than my dilemma. God is going to take me through the other side. Courage is saying, I will not quit, I'll keep going. Courage is not the absence of fear. It's doing it in spite of fear. Don't lose sight of the shore this morning. Make it through the storm. Number three, there's an anchor of worship. When you get into a storm, you're not supposed to whine and complain about how bad the storm is. Worship, worship is what we do in the storms. We don't worship for him for what he's done. We worship him for who he is. Do you understand that this morning? For who he is. And you begin to worship God. That's where the answers will come. That's where victory will come. That's where breakthrough will come. Drop the anchor of worship this morning. And say nothing's going to stop me. 
The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. And I know some this morning may sit, th sit here thinking, well, this doesn't concern me. I'm not going through a storm. It's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time. And then this will all mean something. Number four, the anchor to the church. I think this is the most important one. And for this last point, I brought a prop. I think everybody will enjoy it. Now you'll have to. I, I live in Macon, Georgia. There's not a lot of supply of anchors. I had to do with what I had. There's not a lot of water around here. So if, yes, use your man. It's my message, so use your man. This here is your anchor. And I've thrown my anchor over. And I've connected to the rock, which is Jesus. Yes. But in the natural, when you first get saved, you're close to Jesus. Uh -huh. But it, it, I, I can speak firsthand. You slowly, it's, it's nothing you did wrong, you just start drifting away. Uh -huh. You drift away. And you give, it's nothing, you just get busy, and then you start drifting away, and you keep drifting. And the next thing you know it, you're far away from God. But if you're connected to the rock, eventually you'll feel a tug. That's how you know you're safe. You feel the tug. And that's when you know you're in the rock. That's when you pull yourself back to the anchor. You pull back. Now, we all can't be perfect. We're not going to always be right here. But if you're connected with an anchor this morning, You'll feel the tug when you know. And that's how you, that's what separates people who are saved. When you're not saved, you can party and club and do whatever. You won't feel a tug. But when you're saved and you're connected to the rocks this morning, you'll feel the tug on your heart saying, go back. Come back to me, my child. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a very important thing. Very important. Yeah. It's really a powerful anchor. Keep waiting six. I'm sorry, Hebrews 6.18. Two mutual things when you're in a storm. It's impossible for God to lie. The one you're connected to cannot fail. He cannot lie and he cannot lose. Watch this. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Both sure and steadfast. And which enters the presence behind the veil. And what's behind the veil is Jesus. Pretend for a second there's a veil right here. And behind the, old, the veil is the old covenant of the ark. It represents Jesus. He says, I have an anchor of hope. The smallest form of faith is hope. I just hope so. I just hope I haven't lost all hope. Hope. When I take my hope, I take my anchor and I throw it over the veil. It takes hold of the rock, which is Jesus, my provider, my healer, my deliverer. And I have an anchor for my soul. Whatever comes against me, Romans 8, 39, nothing can separate me from the love of God. Amen. Going back, I said, if you're connected with the anchor, nothing can separate you. You might drift afar, but nothing will ever separate you from the love of God. Failure can't. Temptation can't. Disappointment can't. Discouragement can't. I am forever attached. I may drift, but nothing can separate me. Amen. Nothing can separate me by the God who calls me by name. He knows the hairs on my head. We all know the hairs on Derek's. Jesus, I throw, I cast 
my anchor today, Lord Father God, which is my soul. That I may attach it to you, Jesus, the one who died for me and rose again. Lord Jesus. I'll throw all my baggage overboard, Jesus, that I may not sink in the storm. I, nothing can separate you, Jesus, the anchor that holds. Nothing can separate your anchor, which is your love from me, Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Chip of the shoulder and blaming everybody. 
You know, as Christians, we have to be different. Michael, I love the message. And I'm praying that I will continue to draw closer to the Lord and allow to be anchored on Him and have His anchor there for me and to use that in my life. Lighten the ship, get rid of some of the junk that we don't need and focus on our friends and our family and our loved ones and our church. I want to say God bless you this morning. Thanks for being here. I pray that you'll have received something this morning. That will have blessed you. That you can take home with you in the car. As you're driving home with your husband and your wife, you can discuss the things that you've heard. When you get home, you'll say, Hey, Bill, remember what they said to me today? That's so true. I'm going to apply that in my, in my life. I'm going to do that today from the message I have from Michael. And I encourage you to do the same. Is there any prayer requests this morning? The Lord knows what our hearts are. Just raise your hands where you are. Hallelujah, amen, and amen. I see you there, amen, Martha. I see you, Pat. Maggie, I see you too. Hallelujah. Judy, I see you. Just hold your hands up, keep them up, don't be shy. Hallelujah, Marcy. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Little Josiah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. All my life, Lord, you've been so faithful. And I call upon you this morning, as you see our hands raised today, every home, every person, you see their hearts cry. Father, I feel so humble and inadequate so many times. But I have to realize, Lord, it's not in me, Lord, it's not in any power that I have, but it's in you that I've given these people over to, as you see their hands raised, as you see their hearts, Lord Jesus, I ask you, Lord, as your servant, to meet their need, whatever it may be, right where they are, Lord Jesus, that they'll feel your presence. You've told us that you're two or three, you're there with us, Lord, right here in this place. And I ask humbly, Lord Jesus, that your Holy Spirit will move in and through us, Lord, and you'll touch each and every one that has their hands raised in this morning. That is it heard in the song and the worship and they've lifted you up this morning. As I've heard your Lord, your word, Lord Jesus, that we will be greatly changed, mightily changed in you. And Lord, that we'll secure our ship, we'll secure our lives, Lord Jesus. And we'll be prepared, prepared for the storm, Lord, as we walk through it. You're an awesome God. Father, we pray also for our president and all those that are in authority. All the mayors and all the governors and all those who have positions of authority. We pray for everyone, Lord, that they'll have clarity of thought. And Lord, the lead of what you teach and what you are and who you are. We pray for all those folks in Louisiana, Lord, and in Texas who have been affected by this mighty storm that came in and affected so many lives and created havoc. We pray for them all right now, Jesus. The Cajun Army, Navy, and all those that are there to help, we ask, Lord, that you give them blessings, Lord, and you give them strength as they reach out to help others. Lord, we pray for them all today. We ask your blessing to be upon them today. Jesus, have your will in our hearts and our lives. Bless this congregation, Lord. May they be blessed above and beyond whatever they can ask, think, or even dream of, Lord Jesus that you're anointed be in this place this morning and that we'll receive the blessing that you have for us. In Jesus' name, and we all said? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Great for you to be here. Saul is mom. You go out that door there and uh, see Jim and all down the back stairs, you all go first. That area there, and you can fellowship at the bottom. And as soon as they're clear of you, Jim, you can take your drink.